Thank you for coming. I'm uh, James Muscolic. Jeff. And for the next three and a half hours, we're going to talk to you guys <laughs> about how to invest wisely. It's funny because it's true. It's mostly going to be about bonds and GICs, um, that kind of thing. So actually, I actually don't even know what a GIC is. So uh, what uh, we're going to talk to you about is uh, meditate, celebrate, activate as the way of the consciousness explorer. Um, and as we do it in the Consciousness Explorers Club. Um, and I think I can speak to Jeff to, uh, and say that we're humbled that you are here with us today in uh, the midst of so many other worthwhile ways to spend your time, which is typical of wanderlust. Great classes, uh, beautiful people to connect with, and uh, always in a wonderful setting to marinate in and feel close to nature. I took the gondola up to the top of the mountain this morning to do that myself on my last day here in Tremblant. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever do this exercise, but uh, I did it this morning. And it was um, going through the decision-making process. If every decision I've made up to this point in my life, all the heartache, all the confusion that I've experienced, if every decision I've made led up to this moment, to this place where I'm standing right now, would I make them all the same way? And I'm surprised how often that answer is yes. So if I, every decision I made, every hardship I endured led me to be here with you, with my friend talking about how to deepen your own connection to your heart, would it have been worth it? And it, and it was, and it is. So, you know, to be here with a community of people, safe in a country that's free, well-fed, knowing that we're cared for and participating in our own self-care. And all we have outside is the sound of leaves rustling and birds chirping or people laughing and not the heavy artillery of gunfire. You get that sense of deep blessing that we all get to be alive and share this moment together. And it's interesting how touched you can feel by grace when you call your attention back to that present moment that you all share at this time. And when you get to do it in great numbers of people, it even seems deeper, more blessed, more beautiful, more joyous. And that's kind of the way of the Consciousness Explorer and the way of the Consciousness Explorers Club. We practice the meditation to try to cultivate that sense of presence and deep awareness to the present moment. Because you don't necessarily need someone else to remind you of it. You can do it yourself. And that's the practice. And then we try to develop that in community because that's when you start to feel the depth of the joy and from that joy what's possible to contribute back to the world some, even just a fraction of the blessing you feel that you've received. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit as explorers um, how it led us to uh, be here in front of you today. So uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff will yeah. start. Okay, so basically, these are the three principles that are super important to us. Meditate, celebrate, activate. And what we want to do over the next, you know, 28 minutes or whatever is uh, try to give you guys... Uh, well, the second, the, the middle chunk is going to be actually a guided meditation. We're going to try to see if we can connect you to the kind of minimal feeling of what we're talking about when we talk about each of those things. But to, to get into it, and then after that, we may do a little bit of sort of chit-chat about the different principles, if there's something we forgot to say, and then we're going to open up to discussion. But to start... Um, just to kind of bring it into the real, like how, how they actually played out in our lives. So for me, how it played out was, you know, first of all, I never knew anything about meditation. I had zero interest in it, zero. I was actually a science writer. I wrote like, I wrote atheist screeds and I was into neuroscience. And except I had a problem. And my problem was that I basically was constantly in my own head and ruminating and anxious and worried about stuff. And I constantly thought I could think my way to the answer of everything that was happening. And I often felt like I was sort of trapped in this barrier that prevented me from actually really connecting to people. And this is even when I was, you know, as a successful journalist, I was working at CBC, I was in this sort of high intensity media job, but I just was spinning and spinning. So I started to, I'd always been interested in consciousness and I started to research a book about sleep and dreaming and I ended up writing this book. And as part of that book, I ended up at a Buddhist meditation retreat. This is about 10 years ago now. And I was kind of, I mean, at, at the time, I thought I was really the anti-Buddha. I mean, I'm like the least person. I'm like super excitable, thinking all the time, impossible to stay still. So I did this retreat, and there was something about the, the sincerity of the practitioners there, 
the, the quality experience. I wasn't a very good meditator. I, you know, I couldn't meditate still. I consider at the end of that I could barely still meditate. Um, but it did introduce me to uh, a quality, a kind of intimacy. So I just decided to stay with it, and I stayed with it, and my practice deepened, and over the years I went to more and more retreats. And I had this sort of breakthrough moment some years ago that I, I thought I'd explain, because it really dramatized for me how the relationship between meditate and activate. Um, so this was at a retreat with the, my main teacher and James's main teacher, a, a guy named Shinzen Young. And it was in Niagara Falls. It was maybe on the, the fifth or sixth day of the retreat. I was quite calm. I can't even remember what technique I was doing, but I remember it was right before lunch and I was just sitting there, you know, I had my eyes closed. And suddenly, um, have you ever been in the, hanging out in your kitchen and the sound of the fridge suddenly cuts out and you realize, wow, the, science, the silence is surprising. You didn't even realize there was a sound of a fridge before, but now you, there's this contrast. It was exactly like that. Suddenly, the sound of the fridge dropped out. The fridge was my own internal commentary. And I had always, it wasn't even a dramatic internal commentary, it was just this very subtle kind of sense of negotiation that was constantly happening in my experience. I like it, I don't like it, I like it, I don't like it. What's going to be for lunch? Is this going to happen here? Even when I was relatively quiet, there was this sort of interference, this susurration. Suddenly it just completely dropped out. And it was very dramatic. To, you know, wow, it was a huge contrast. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And, I, and what I noticed right away was that I had no desire to be anywhere else. I, was, I, could, I could have sat like that for hours and hours because there was that negotiation was gone. It was just being in the present. So this was interesting enough, but it got really interesting when I went up, when the bell rang and I went up to lunch. And I went in and I sat down and um, I started eating my food. And, you know, I ate my food and it was okay, but I realized about halfway through the meal, oh, actually, I'm full. I mean, normally I would have just sort of wolfed it down on automatic, but there was this, like, actually, I was completely in touch with my sensations. I don't need to eat anymore. I stopped eating and I, I stood up and I, I looked around and I was trying to figure out what was different about what I was experiencing. And I realized I could, everyone around me, I could look them in the eye in, in a way that I had never been able to look at them in the eye before. It was... I realized up until that time, there had always been this level of this desire to like, I want to be liked, I want to, I want to manage the situation right, am I going to be okay? This like constant susurration of like feeling not at ease. And that was completely gone. And with that gone, looking at other people, I started noticing all these things about them. How they were dressed, the, the, the looks on their faces, I could tell who was in, in pain and who was more open and who was f feeling really good. I, all this stuff, though, these signals that were always there, but I, that I couldn't see because I'd, all the time I'd been trapped behind this barrier of rumination, like trapped in my own concerns and worries. As soon as that settled down, I could really start to see in a much more naked way who people were, what was going on around me. And that really marked a, a sea change in my practice. It was after that, finding this more... now the ruminations came back, you know, it wasn't like, it, it was just like, I went back to being totally neurotic. But ever, ever, ever since then, I've, I've been able to kind of find that more spacious quality. And whenever I'm in that more spacious quality, and, and we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to one way to find it when we do the guided meditation. Whenever I'm in that, it's like, as soon as I settle, what naturally comes up is my desire to help other people, to activate. So it ended up leading to uh, my teacher encouraging me to teach, eventually starting the, the Consciousness Explorers Club, and now we've got a huge community, and a lot of people, for them, it really it helps them. They find it's a way to kind of deal with their crazy urban life. So, so the, the, desire, the more I meditate, the more my, this desire to kind of give back sort of naturally upwells, and the celebration sustains it, as I'll, I'll get to in a bit, but we'll let James tell his little mini story. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess similar to Jeff, I probably came to it from a deep-seeking place, a uh, curiosity. Um, in medical school, I remember the uh, uh, tumbler in the lock kind of first, the first one fell. And I was reading a book and I came across this poem by this Tibetan monk called Long Chepa. And I don't know if you know that uh, man, but uh, he wrote a poem that goes something like, since everything is but an apparition, perfect in being what it is, caring nothing about good or evil or right or wrong, one might simply burst out into laughter. And the wisdom of that struck me in that the world was an objective place. 
It was just was happening all the time. What changed was what, how I felt about it. And so drawn to that wisdom, I started to search more in that direction. And at around the same time, I was uh, in medical school and I was being taught that my job was to take care of the sick ones. You know, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter when, you know, middle of the night, or if you're on a plane over the Atlantic, if someone says, is there a doctor on board, you're supposed to stick up your hand. And I traveled my, really my very first time to work in a, in a, a public health system in a developing country, mostly to impress this girl. Um, we worked, and, uh, um, but I realized that, well, if I was being taught to take care of the sick ones, the sickest seemed to be in other places. So it led me to do that kind of medicine where there weren't many doctors because the population couldn't afford them or because there was a conflict going on. And I'd returned back from one of those experiences. I was working in Cambodia and I was talking, I was a young doctor at the time, I was talking to the surgeon who'd helped set me this experience up and uh, I was having that now familiar sense of uh, disequilibrium that one experiences upon their return and saying, you know, you know, why should I care about a bunch of starving Khmer Rouge in the jungle or street kids in Brazil? And he said to me, because it's your bloody duty to care. That's why. And I thought, oh, I'm perfect, you know. I have purpose, I have a duty, you know, I can, I can, I can discharge that, right, through my actions. And I lived on that for a long time, actually, and uh, it led me to work with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. And it wasn't until I found myself uh, back from Sudan and uh, having borne witness to things that uh, I didn't uh, know I would see, uh, people starving and uh, killing each other and being asked to write a book about it. So not only did I have to try to turn up what I'd seen and, and, and integrate it into my life, I had to recall it and put it down and to pages again in a way that other people might uh, identify with. And I was sitting around a table with some friends, it's about six months after I got back, and someone's making a joke and I found myself laughing and I was like, whoa, what's this, what's this strange feeling that I'm experiencing? It's so uh, rare, it's been so long, I couldn't recognize this clear, sweet feeling. What is it? Oh yeah, it's joy. I felt joy. And in that moment, I made a contract with myself, I should never be that far away from that ever again. So I wrote that book, and uh, as it was about to come out, I was, um, found myself at a party celebrating another author, and I was talking with an editor who I quite respected, and she said to me, so your book's coming out. And I said, yeah, yeah. Are you excited? You know, very much excited. Um, how are you going to deal with the attention that you receive? And I was kind of puzzled and I said, well, you know, what do you mean? She said, you know, when that bright light shines on you, you're going to forget why you wrote that book in the first place. It's possible you'll forget. It's possible you're going to forget why you did that kind of medicine in the first place. And I recognized the wisdom in her words. So I rekindled this practice that I started in medical school. And I started to sit every day. And then the aphorism goes, and the teacher appeared, and I've sat every day since. And I sit for those two reasons. One, to call, find that feeling of joy, even in times of difficulty, that current of happiness that runs even through the most difficult circumstances. And also to be clear about the ground from which right action appears. And as Jeff says, you know, it's from that space that surrounds even the most difficult things that allow you the room to maneuver in your own best interest or in the interest of another person. You know, but uh, talking about action is like writing about music. So um, maybe we should uh, uh, act. Um, maybe you might, we'll start with the practice. Maybe. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll so let's actually see if we can get you guys to connect with a little bit about what we're talking about. And so I'm going to lead you in a guided meditation, and James is going to continue a, a little in a little bit. But we're going to start with um, one of the things I'm really interested in is somebody writes about consciousness is what is the, what's the bare minimum necessary in a practice? Like what is the kind of essence of what we're trying to get to? What will sustain us? What will create that, that space that we're talking about? So if you guys all want to close your eyes, I'll see if we can begin to 
orient you to like this, the, 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 the super basics of meditation. I'm sure lots of you have meditated before, but this is going to be its own perspective. Oops, so everybody close your eyes. So we're going to start by taking a couple of deep breaths, just inhaling. And as you exhale, just softening your, softening your face and your, your cheeks and your jaw. And sort of stretching up the spine on the inhale. And on the exhale, softening your, your shoulders. Just letting your body kind of settle down now into the bench or into the cushion. So the very first thing we do in a meditation is see if you can connect to a sense of composure in the posture. So by that I mean a kind of good-natured openness. You kind of want to imagine my words floating right through you, as if you're not creating a shield for them, just sort of going right through you. So this piece here is, is equanimity. And equanimity is, the way I use equanimity is it's a lack of pushing and pulling on our experience. It's a kind of radical allowing. So again, just find a kind of openness and notice what it feels like for you. Some people describe it as a, a kind of lightness. For some, it's a feeling of presence, of openness. So just noticing that that bare flavor, what it's like for you. It's like you're not resisting anything, you're not tensing. You're letting everything be what it is, your body sensations, the sounds from outside. Within that sitting, within that openness, noticing the quality of your own being, you exist. You exist, not the content of your existence, the fact of it. Just this feeling of being. Everything in your life is changing, except for one thing, the fact that you exist in the first place. So just holding that openness, that fact of your existence, it's like sort of a kind of existential highlighter. You're highlighting your being. So this is the bare minimum of meditation. It's connecting to this sense of openness, letting the moment be what it is. Now there are some other qualities that we, we build up as we, as we practice. So in a sense, there's also this training aspect to meditation, which is you're raising your baseline levels of a few different things. So one of these is that equanimity that I'm pointing to right now, this feeling of openness. Over time, the more you practice, the more this quality expands and spills out into your life. But the next piece is the sensory clarity piece. So bring your attention now to a particular object in your awareness. So the breath is an easy one. It could be the breath in and out of the nose, or maybe you want to notice the breath deeper down in your belly. Or if you're more of an expansive type, you may want to bring your attention to the feeling of space or sound around you. Lots of directions. Whichever direction, keep that openness but now, get very curious about the particulate matter of the experience you're having. How the breath may very subtly vibrate. Really sending your attention into, say, sounds, if you're working with that. So it's like you're kind of beginning to steep your attention in the object of your awareness. This is the second piece. Over time, the resolution in our attention sort of increases. We start to get clear and clear. More and more of what's been unconscious enters into our consciousness. We get more and more aware. Now, it, it may be that your attention wanders a bit. You get caught up with a thought. If that happens, you just 
gently bring it back to that object of awareness. That's the third piece, concentration, sort of the bread and butter. The mind wanders, you notice, you bring it back. Always with this sort of good-natured smile. It's like, oh yeah, there's the mind doing its thing, it comes back. It's sort of like, you want to be like a grandparent noticing a little kid in the playground. That's how you can treat yourself. And again, is there the taste of openness within this experience? Letting the breath, the sounds, the sensations just do their thing. Okay, good. So this gives us a little bit about meditation itself, sort of the very bare, simplest qualities of meditation. But now we want to add this celebration piece. So meditation, if meditation is sort of preparing the ground, over top of that open ground, you can build all kinds of qualities, including a sense of compassion and joy and love. So I'll give you a very simple meditation now. This one, you can keep your eyes closed. As you breathe in, just repeat the words, thank you. This is quietly to yourself. So you breathe in and say the words, thank you. And as you breathe out, you say the words, I love you, or I like you, if, I, if love seems scary or charged. So you're breathing in, thank you. And you're breathing out. So you're breathing in your, your appreciation, your, your thankfulness and you're breathing out your affection. Just back and forth. So now to add to that, as you're breathing in, think of the things that you're thankful for. So the, the air, this beautiful setting in nature, your friends, thank you. So you breathe in your thanks, and that, and that appreciation stokes the ember in your heart. Now you've got some warmth in there, and you breathe out then your affection, you breathe out that warmth. You say, I love you, I like you, I care for you. You're breathing it out back out to the world. So this, in this way, we, we, we receive love from the world, and we express love. So it's like you're stoking that ember of your heart, you're putting more and more fuel in your heart. So just this simple in and out breath. So this gets even more interesting as we practice this as we go out in the world. So we might, as we go out into nature, open our eyes and see a view that we like. Thank you. So you breathe in your thanks. Thank you for that view. You breathe out your affection. You see an act of something good that someone's done. You breathe in your appreciation for it. You breathe out your affection. In in Greek philosophy, they talk about the three transcendentals, the good, the beautiful, and the true. Each one of those things is an opportunity to practice this meditation. Breathe in, you breathe out. The, the, the thing that really starts to change it is when you realize every time you see a view that you like, anytime you see anything beautiful that you like, you're already doing this meditation. The idea is just to bring a little extra bit of conscious attention to the fact that that's happened that you've noticed something beautiful. You've received a pulse of something beautiful from the world. You breathe in your thanks for it. You breathe out your affection back. So this quality begins to suffuse our experience with a kind of friendly, appreciative quality. It's a practice like any other. You just repeat it, and even if at first it's not doing much, it seems very subtle. I mean, when I first started doing these practices, it would be like nothing would happen. I, mean, I thought I was a robot. But over time, if you find it suffuses your experience with a kind of friendliness and a responsiveness. So now the, the conditions are set to, to give back, to actually get up, enter into the world, you know, to do what you do, to act in the world. So the question then is how can you do that as we're acting in the world? What kind of practice can we do for that? So I'll let James continue on a little guided meditation. To continue to connect with your breathing. The sense of volume on the inhale. The easy and smooth release on the exhale. It's 
stay focused on your breathing, but I want you to create actively in your mind's eye an image of a scene that you've experienced recently. It was a source of some challenge. It could happen today or sometime this week. It could have been a time where you felt uh, frustrated, confused, socially awkward. Anything will do. Something that maybe contained a glimmer of overwhelm. And make the scene as vivid and real as possible. Faces on people, sound, conversation perhaps. And on the in-breath, I want you to contact that difficult feeling. Make it vivid, full. The first step towards dealing with them is being clear about what we're experiencing. So on the inhale, contact that feeling associated with that image or scene. And on the exhale, let it go. Inhale, contact, exhale, release into the great expanse around us. It's possible, though not necessarily so, that you can notice on the exhale, on the release, a slight easing of that feeling. It may diminish in intensity or high frequency may tamp down slightly. You may actually notice even a space of openness accrues. This is that open space in which action can erupt, right action. Not the action from the confusion or the overwhelm. It's difficult to know what to do. It's difficult for anyone, no matter how experienced. But as it ebbs, as you allow it to do what it will, which is fade, you give yourself an opportunity to see the space in which right action can occur. It's possible to work with this technique and these challenging instances in real time. It's important to practice on the cushion as we are today, but then bring it into your daily life, into those actions as they occur in the moment. That's practice in action. So actually, I think <laughs> we talked a lot. We did a longer, slightly longer practice than we were anticipating, so we're almost at 30 minutes. So um, what we'll do is maybe open it up to discussion now, because there's a lot, of more, and we, a lot more we have to say about the way these different principles all interact. Um, but I wanted to try to give you a bit of a flavor of what we, when we talk about those three things, what, are the, what is the sort of minimum that we can already identify happening in our own life? Maybe we can just say a couple minutes about uh, um, a couple words about the Conscious Explorers Club and the way of the Consciousness Explorer as we practice it, and maybe that can lead to some questions from you or a conversation where we can um, deepen our understanding of uh, some of the things we talk about. But I know Jeff and I are in, uh, enchanted with this idea because it is uh, something that fits into the setting in which we practice it. And a lot of the people who come to the CEC in Toronto are people who live in the downtown urban setting. And I don't know how you feel about your ability to practice in the city, but it's really hard. You know, I unfortunately can't even anticipate a year when I'm going to go into a monastery. The life, my life just does not afford it. 
So can you bring the monastery to the city? Can you make the streetcar your monastery? When you're standing in line and the person in front of you starts tapping their foot and creates in you a feeling that now you got somewhere to go, can you work with what comes up? So what we do in the CEC, we do the practice in stillness, and there's a second part of the, the meditation piece that is practice in action. So we do a social practice. So how do you work with these things in, in real time? How do you work with difficult sounds? How do you work with, how do you work with these things? You know, we're more connected to millions of people, but we're rarely afforded the opportunity to connect deeply with ourselves. So, you know, how that plays into some of the things that we do is I think that in the face of a lot of what seems mindless, mindfulness is ever more needed. In the face of all these great challenges that come with, you know, 8 billion people trying to coexist on a finite ecosphere, when generosity needs to go way up, you know. Um, and in terms of practicing, the fact that you guys do it, the fact that you're here at all or you have your own practice um, is almost the best antidote that I can think of in towards the transformation that we all want to be part of, not just our own, our own spiritual transformation into our truest nature, but to make the world a little bit easier for everyone in it. So, um, you know, that's the, 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 the enthusiasm that comes from that, at least for me. Yeah, and like the ideal outcome for me would be to like inspire other people to start their own versions, their own kind of like 21st century community centers wherever you are. By just getting a few free friends together, you know, you start to practice. It's really important to have contact with the teacher if you're starting to go deeper with the techniques. But have a regular sitting time where you're getting together, you're kind of exploring. You can keep a kind of multidisciplinary outlook. I think part of, uh, for us, we work with a lot of people who are, you know, kind of scientists and doctors and artists and writers and... There's a lot of, of secular-minded people who are actually fairly spiritually malnourished in a way because they basically view all spirituality and religion as sort of suspect. So we're interested in how we can bring these techniques to them as a kind of exploration. They can learn for themselves how the experiences change them. Um, we, have, we do these dance parties just because people need to celebrate. They need this, this joyous quality in their life. And we try to emphasize how to keep you know, your mindfulness when things are going off in a nightclub or whatever. How can you keep your attention, how can you keep that warmth, how can you present a, be in a space that's not about attitude, that's just about empowering other people to find their, their rhythm and enjoying the music. And then finally we do these, um, we've been working on putting together these sort of social justice activation nights, which are, um, they're kind of about profiling people in our community, not necessarily even uh, explicitly about the social justice agenda, but showing how everyone, wherever you're at, you can activate in your own way, according to your own capacities and your own circumstances. So what does that actually mean practically in the 21st century? Knowing how a lot of the friends that we have that are super activists are actually burning out like crazy. You know, they're, they're bringing the same kind of egoic, rah-rah mindset to the solving the world's problems that, say, you know, hardcore capitalists are bringing to making money. And so the, the issue there is that they... It, you know, there needs to be a, a, a practice to support yourself in the giving back so you don't burn out, so you don't freak out, so you don't bum out, like all the, the three outs as I, my teacher talks about it. So those are a little bit more about the kind of stuff that we do, but I, I guess I'm curious about how it, it, you know, these things are experienced in your lives or any questions about it or where you're fine, where, where, the, where the challenges are, because that's what's really interesting is where you may have these as an ideal, but it's like then you hit reality and it doesn't, you know, quite rule out in that, quite that way, so... Um, should we open Let's it up? Let's open it up to some questions. Sure. Yeah.